tremendous figure. I live in South London, so I feel like he's my local mystic. And I've been really glad this evening, actually, to have a chance to spend some time just trying to deepen my sense of what Blake is going on about. Um, he's one of these figures that you can get something almost instantly from by one of his well-known anecdotes or sayings, for example. But he invites us constantly and continually, almost for a lifetime, I think, to engage with what he means more and more by cleansing the doors of perception. And looking at him through this theme of dualities, um, I found very productive and interesting, and I hope that you do too now as well. Um, I wanted to start by giving us a feel for what Blake meant by dualities, um, looking at that in four ways, really. Then doing a bit more of a push at why they're so important and how they work. And then thirdly, thinking about his notion of dividing, um, which is another take on dualities, integral to what he called contraries, in fact. But this theme of dividing, which is so big in his work. And then finally coming back to how we might experience this directly in our own lives, in fact. So it's not just um, enjoyed through his poetry and imagery, but how it connects directly into our own embrace of contraries in life, seeking the divine vision as Blake called it. So in four parts, um, we'll look, first of all, the feel, then how they work, then the notion of dividing, and then how we might ourselves be able to embrace this approach to life. I think Blake, like Dante, like Plato, is not just doing for his own benefit, but he is, as he said, offering us the end of a golden string, inviting us to wind it into a ball, <coughs> because he promises it will lead to heaven's gate built in Jerusalem's wall. So let's start that winding and pick up the golden string. And first of all, think about um, his use of illustrations. This is one of his poems from the Songs of Innocence and Experience, one of the better known ones, London. And I'm going to read it. And I want you to both hear the words, but also consider the imagery at the same time. Blake uses imagery not just to illustrate, but to resonate, to oscillate, and thereby evoke more in what he's saying. He famously invented this means of producing his work that he could control both the imagery and the words. Um, so he's very deliberate about this. Anyway, let me read through the poem and then I'll make some comments. I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. So what's so striking about this picture of London in words that Blake gives us from his time near the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, um, when the dark satanic mills um, were beginning to appear. He didn't see the Industrial Revolution in completely full swing, but nonetheless saw the beginnings of it and realised that it was as much a product of the imagination as it was of industry, hence the mind forged, man mind forged manacles. But what I hope you are wondering about when you hear really words of despair and bleakness is looking at the illuminations there, you see actually signs of warmth and humanity and help and even of forgiveness. 
Um, there's the figure of the old man on crutches being led by the young boy, I guess it is. And then, of course, the figure there of the figure warming himself by the fire halfway down. And whilst there's shadows, there's blues and greens of nature as well as um, the chartered streets and chartered Thames that he's talking about in the poem. And I think that this immediately gives us a sense of a key, key theme for Blake is that no matter how dark it gets, the light actually is never far away. And if you know how to look, if you can cleanse the doors of perception, you can see it, you can stay in touch with it. So that's one of the big themes of this evening, which I'll try and unpack and say more of, but comes up a lot, um, even in his early work, like London from the Songs of Innocence and Experience. Now, the psychology and even philosophy of this is developed in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, another early work where dualities, contraries, as he called them, um, are explored. Remembering that Blake, you know, is a thinker as much as he's a poet um, and a creative. Um, he engaged very deeply with the emerging modernist philosophies of his time, particularly as written about by Francis Bacon and John Locke. And his pithy sayings are actually brilliantly thought through summaries, often critiquing the mechanical philosophy as it came to be known. They're not just catchy phrases, they're penetrating analyses, in fact. And here in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell is a early attempt to bring some of those things together. And I just wanted to read a few lines, picking it up about halfway down this page, which you can see, uh, where he writes, um, without contraries is no progression, attraction and repulsion, reason and energy, love and hate are necessary to human existence. From these contraries spring what the religious call good and evil. Good is the passive that obeys reason. Evil is the active springing from energy. Good is heaven, evil is hell. And over the page, which I haven't got to show you, he adds, energy is the only life and is from the body and reason is the bound or outward circumference of energy. Energy is eternal delight. Now, in the earlier part of his work, um, in the first half of his life, Blake thought a lot about energy, about impulse, about instinct. And he calls it infernal or evil or hellish in order to use another contrary, that of heaven and hell, to make us think again about impulse and energy and the erotic. Um, he saw the church of his time and figures around him as well, he felt rather domesticating energy and the erotic, even binding it and constraining it in mind Ford Manacles or in the marriage hearse. And so he wanted to inject new flame, as you can see at the top of the page there, into these dynamics, which we know so well, and see how they might spring us actually to true heaven, um, rather than locking us in hell. And hence the phrase, the marriage of heaven and hell. Um, you know, marriage, not just referring to coming together, but marrying as in the truth that springs when two things resonate, when they touch in this way. Um, you know, so evil at this moment, at least in Blake's work, is a provocation against, you might say, bland moral goodness which doesn't help us rise towards divine sight, doesn't cleanse the doors of perception, but rather tells us what to do. He um, turned to calling it the wastes of the moral law, and wastes there is a bit like lands that can be wasted, a life that can be wasted. Um, it flattens by, say, being informed how to behave, rather than awakening to, the fullness of life, the divine vision. So 
that's partly what's going on here. But these contraries, attraction and repulsion, reason and energy, love and hate. He's also saying to us, don't choose one or the other, bring them together. And in that dynamic, we'll find that which can lift us to the divine vision. So that's just to say a little bit more, not just for how he brings things alongside so we see it in his work, but how there's a philosophy and a psychology that he's beginning to develop too here. Jung would call it the transcend transcendent function. For those of you who know your Jung, um, he felt that there's a part of the psyche that by wrestling with that which seems opposed, realizes that they aren't actually opposed, but can help us spiral up. Um, Dante last week called it simply looking up. Um, never forget the stars, he would say. Um, and going back to the first week, Plato, this is very much what Plato talked about loving, why his philosophy, as someone has said, could even be called erosophy, um, using desire in combination with the intellect to lift us to a higher life. It tells us something about how we work, how life is not just about pursuing pleasure, um, certainly not about controlling um, through moral law or anything else, um, but about questing for meaning. And it's meaning found by marrying our lives with reality so that two lives come together. And those contraries can show up in all sorts of ways, you know, us and reality, attraction and repulsion, heaven and hell. Um, it's that dynamic Blake is starting to say more about here. Now, this though also opens up depth in life it's not just as it were our psychology but the inside of the whole world that can be felt here um, both in terms of mortal life and immortal life of the finite and the infinite and i wanted to show two more poems from the marriage from um songs of innocence and experience very well known the tiger's probably blake's best known poem of all and then one that's nearly equally as known the lamb I'm going to read them through again, and then hopefully you can feel something of the resonance. One comes from innocence, the lamb, and the other comes from experience, the tiger. So let me read them through first as you look. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Gave thee life and bid thee feed by the stream and o'er the mead. Gave thee clothing of delight, so woolly clothing, woolly bright gave thee such a tender voice, making all the veils rejoice. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Little lamb, I'll tell thee. Little lamb, I'll tell thee. He is called by thy name, for he calls himself a lamb. He is meek and he is mild. He became a little child. I a child, and thou a lamb, we are called by his name. Little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. So this is a song of innocence. Innocence here meaning the sense that the world is right for us, that we can lean into it, we can trust it, that we are part of a civilization that can open it up for us. And of course, the reference to the lamb is a reference to Jesus and Christianity at its best, which Blake wanted to celebrate and revive, as well as critique in the forms that came to him. But you'll notice the deepest kind of spiritual perception here already that the child, the lamb, and the divine you and I, the whole of nature, are actually one. We're all called by God's name. And so it's inviting us not just to have a sentimental journey, um, but to push through to the deepest perception of all things. But turning to the tiger, that is given a twist, but a twist that makes for new energy, new dynamism in this song of experience. I'll read it again. 
Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hands and what dread feet? What the hammer? What the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil? What dread grasp dare its dread deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? So we have that incredible line, did he who made the lamb make thee? And saying that somehow the one being of the lamb and the child and you and I is also the one being of the tiger. Experience can teach us about things quite as much as innocence when the two come together. And that which feels difficult or bamboozling the journey down as much as the journey up to remember Blake, for, to remember Dante from last week, um, amplifies the awareness of experience cleanses the doors of perception. And so that's another key part, I think, of the contraries in Blake's work. It's not just the sense that life has um, a psychology that brings these two things together, not just a kind of ascetic experience from the poem um, that I read first of all, but now too that there's something about the, the depth of life that brings further perception when we can tolerate all of life, even when it is frightening, fearful, difficult, um, like the tiger's um, sinews of its heart, um, the hammer, the chain, the furnace that produced its brain. A third notion. Now, here's a fourth, because I think what's also to, really valuable um, to remember with Blake is that. Um, Sorry, let me. Yeah, is that he dramatizes powerfully for us the um, the notion of this happening, so that we feel it in the poetry itself. And um, he's not just telling us; he's showing us. Would be the way of putting it. Um, he makes it exciting. He makes it tense. Again, builds this kind of erotic feel. Um, he makes us long for it um, and promises that we can have it all if we cultivate that longing for it. Um, he said that he was writing in the prophetic and poetic voice. By prophetic, he meant seeing more of reality. By poetry, he means making poesis, something that he can give to us. Um, and so not just going for the empirical or the philosophical, um, the way that the scientific revolution, the mechanical philosophy was developing. Um, and that leads to the sense of a kind of openness within experience, an open system cosmos, not a closed, trapped, bounded um, sense of life. Um, he wants us to yearn for the infinite and not rest with the finite, but nonetheless embrace the finite to leap to the infinite. And he explains this in no uncertain terms in one of his very, very earliest works, um, three pages of which I've put up now, um, called There is No Natural Religion. Um, by natural, he meant that it springs from the finite world, from human souls detached from God. Um, he was very against the deism of his time, the idea that, OK, maybe there was a divine creator, but then the divine creator had little or no part in sustaining the cosmos in its unfolding, apart from maybe an occasional miraculous intervention. 
and that deism made way for the atheism of the 19th and 20th century, which we now know so well, so that there are evolutionary explanations for the emergence of religion completely within the natural frame. Um, maybe it's good for our sociality, maybe it's good to keep us under control in civilization, the evolutionary accounts might say. Blake is completely against that and he nails it. Why? That just doesn't work. And so let me read through these three plates. Um, the first one um, is in a way the reason why capitalism, you might say, sort of makes us ill. Um, why this bounded, natural approach to life without the infinite um, almost threatens to destroy us. So in plate four, he says, the bounded is loathed by its possessor. The same dull round, even of a universe, would soon become a mill with complicated wheels. So saying that if were given a bounded universe, one without the divine, one that looks inwards rather than constantly reaching outwards, we come to loathe it. And in that, I think, is the consumption that we see so much today, and it's so easy to get caught up in as well, that it, it says, you know, have a bit more, have a bit more, grab this, possess that, um, accumulate. Um, but in small bites, in self-contained products, um, and we sim simultaneously want more, but also loathe this possession because it leads to the same dull round. Um, the, the novelty, the life, the light of things starts to fade. Um, and instead, we feel we're caught up in complicated wheels and life becomes like a meal. Um, a hedonic treadmill, as it's sometimes put now. Blake realises very, very early on why this way of life would make us ill. And then in plate five, he explains why a related feature of modern life, the pursuit of growth for growth's sake, is such a terrible mistake. Um, he says, if the many become the same as the few when possessed, more more is the cry of a mistaken soul less than all cannot satisfy man. So what he's saying here is that in this world where we cry more and more and aim to possess more and more, many things is the same as few things. Um, you know, the billionaire, as it were, doesn't have any more happiness than the person who's got enough to get by. And the reason is that we're crying more and more, which is a terrible mistake because we are human beings who long for it all. And the infinite alone can satisfy us. The divine vision alone can bring us what we seek. And I particularly like Blake for this because sometimes it's possible to hear people saying that we must limit life. We must not go for more and more in life. We must trim growth, maybe even have a sort of flat kind of economic model of what we could aspire for. And I think Blake realized that, that that's a terrible mistake because it's in the human soul to want it all. Capitalism understands that in fact, um, but diverts the all to the purely material world, um, to um, the bounded. And what Blake is saying no, is don't give up on this yearning for all, but understand properly how it might work, cleanse the doors of perception and see the infinite. And then in the third plate, um, this is his conclusion of his analysis in these other earlier, um, I hope you can see how they're really penetrating philosophical remarks, um, not just kind of neat comments. Um, you can reflect on them uh, more and more, um, but he concludes, he says, if it were not for the poetic or prophetic character, the philosophic and experimental would soon be at the erasure of all things and stand still, unable to do other than repeat the same dull round over again. So he's saying what we need is the poetic and the prophetic, that which makes and looks more deeply, not just the philosophic and experimental. Um, by that he means the purely 
rational approach to life, the kind of self-contained logic, which assumes that if only it can work itself out, it can work everything out. And neither the experimental as well, that which would stick just with the senses five. Um, if we do that, we just go around and around and around ourselves. And it's a kind of repetition compulsion, as Freud put it, where it feels like we're pursuing things, feels like we're being active, but actually everything's just standing still, unable to do the same, un unable to do other than repeat the same dull round over and again. And um, so Blake is saying here, you know, we need the drama of the psyche and spirit, um, not just the depth psychology of it, not just the cultivation of the resonances and the contraries, um, in order to find a way out of the present predicament. And I wanted to give a taste of that um, now as well, um, by drawing on his poem, Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, um, the last and in a way, greatest of his many great works, I think, um, because this is the truth of eternity, um, which appears to Albion, his great character in the poem, when Albion awakes from the dull round, when Albion awakes from the desire to possess, when Albion turns from treating reason as if it can work all things out, Albion realises his folly, awakens, and this is how Blake describes it. He says, Albion spoke and threw himself into the furnaces of affliction. So he throws himself into the world of contraries and opposition, the furnaces of affliction. And all was a vision, all a dream. The furnaces became fountains of living waters flowing from the humanity divine. And all the cities of Albion arose from their slumbers. And all the sons and daughters of Albion rose from their slumbers on soft clouds waking from sleep. Soon all around remote, the heavens burnt with flaming fires and Eurizon and Luva and Tharmas and Orthona arose into Albion's bosom. Then Albion stood before Jesus in the clouds of heaven fourfold among the visions of God in eternity. Awake, awake, Jerusalem, O lovely emanation of Albion. Awaken or spread all nations as in ancient time. For lo, the night of death is past and the eternal day appears upon our hills. Awake, Jerusalem, and come away. So spake the vision of Albion, and in him so spake in my hearing the universal father. Then Albion stretched his hand into infinitude and took his bow fourfold the vision for bright beaming euros and laid his hand on the south and took a breathing bow of carved gold Luva, his hand stretched to the east and bore a silver bow bright shining Tharmas westward a bow of brass pure flaming richly wrought orthona northward in thick storms a bow of iron terrible thundering now there's a lot going on in that, and there's a lot of names, some no doubt familiar, some feeling strange. Um, this is what Blake invites you into more and more, having given you um, the quick summary. Um, but it's about always pursuing this energy for transformation and cleanse perception and awakening and reaching out north, south, east and west, reaching through all the faculties we have. Um, you know, Tharmas is like instinct, Luva is like emotion, Orthona is like imagination. Reason's there as well, Euros and reason is there as well, but it's in the service of these other dynamics now, and so reaches for the infinite. So that's kind of like part one, um, a sense for Contrary's opposition in Blake, how it can bind us down when we lose them, but how it can awaken us and lift us up when we find them. So I wanted to say now in part two, a kind of little more about this dynamic and how it works. Now here is an early printing of a very famous remark Blake makes in his notebook really called A Vision of the Last Judgment now often. And it recalls Blake having a conversation with an imagined interlocutor as Blake looks at the sun. I'll read it out and then make some remarks on it. He says, I assert for myself that I do not behold the outward creation and that to me it is a hindrance and not action. 
what it will be questioned when the sun rises do you not see a round disc of fire somewhat like a guinea oh no no i see an innumerable company of the heavenly host crying holy 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 is the lord god almighty i question not my corporeal eye any more than i would question the window concerning a sight i look through it and not with it so Blake here is giving us a first explanation, at least, of how he looks through to the infinite and cleanses the doors of perception and how he seeks, you might say, the inner, not just the outer appearance. It's an active way of looking at the world, bringing the empirical into dialogue, marrying with the imaginative and so seeing more of reality. So in the first sentence there, he kind of explains something of this out, this active looking, when he says, I assert for myself that I do not behold the outward creation. So this would be appearances, just the empirical, just the rational. And that to me is a hindrance. If you did just that, it would hold you back. It's not actually an action. It's not engaging all you are with all that you see and so really seeing everything more fully. So that's the first comment. And then he explains what he sees when he does this. So his interlocutor says, what? When the sun rises, do you not see a round disc of fire somewhat like a guinea? That's the outward creation. That's the empirical manifestation, beautiful as it is. But Blake says, no, no, if you engage with this active participation, bringing all that you see with the mind's eye, as well as all that you see with the physical eye, you see an innumerable company of the heavenly host crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then he adds this further gloss, um, explaining the mistake of mere empiricism, which incidentally not even the scientist really follows, because there are no useful facts without interpretation. There are, there are no observation without the theory that can illuminate the observation. Um, and Blake says that we all do this really. We don't just look with the corporeal eye, the physical eye, um, any more than we just look at the window when we look at something outside our house. We're always already looking with our imagination. The difference is that he doesn't question the corporeal eye any more than he will question a window concerning a sight. And by question there, I think he means sort of stay with it. Um, he says, no, I look through my corporeal eyes, not with my corporeal eyes. It's the coming together of the imaginative vision of the poetic and the prophetic um, that enables us to see the world. We're always already doing it, I think, in Blake. Um, the scientist as much as the artist, the materialist as much as the spirit-filled pursuer and quester of life. The question is, are you only bringing the materialist or the, imaginative, the mechanical imagination to bear upon what you see? Or are you bringing the more that Blake says is available to us as well? It's a theory of how we see, if you like, um, not just um, a kind of mystical vision as to what we can see. He's saying, you know, don't just look, but bring yourself to the act of looking. We as individuals are part of the same cosmos as what we're observing, and we're not actually objective, disconnected onlookers, um, although that is the kind of scientific ideal, strangely. Um, we are part and parcel, already participating um, with what we are engaging with um, you know the artist does this when they create um, they engage with their materials as much as what they're looking and have patience with themselves to make their work um, and the mystic of course does the same when they contemplate and they're as much interested in what's going on in their inner life and understanding that to experience what's going on in the inner life of the world around them as well as coming closer to the divine inner life the mind is related to thought as the eye is to light. So much as the eye receives light, so the mind receives thought. But the eye has got to look and the mind has got to look as well. 
the mind's eye has got to look at with a deliberate act of attention or will. Um, active imagination would be Jung's expression. When it does that, it's really merging in the object, the individual nature of thought. That is what we're doing. We're participating. We're not just making abstract observations as the empirical philosophy would tell us. Um, Coleridge, um, who knew Blake, they met when Blake was older and Coleridge was a young man, um, put it as the mind's self-experience in the act of thinking. Again, this stress on the act of thinking, bringing the mind's self to the experience. Polarities um, was Coleridge's word. Um, in his version of, as it were, contraries um, or oppositions. And he too, you know, like Blake, was rather fascinated by the emerging science with its coils and magnets and movement, um, but saw the dynamism within that and realised it had a spiritual meaning as well as a mechanical meaning. And so, like Blake, invited us to bring science and the spirit together. The mistake is to separate one from the other, discard the spirit and treat the science as if it's got some kind of deeper claim on reality. Um, and this comes right up to the modern world. The British psychotherapist Donald Winnicott, who was deeply influenced by these romantic traditions as well, um, he realised that you know, if, say, our inner life was just full of fantasies that somehow we were managing to generate ourselves, um, we would all be crazy. We wouldn't be able to communicate hardly at all, in fact. Now, what Winnicott added was there's no doubt that we generate fantasies and they can be mistaken, but at least enough, we project them out onto reality. They meet reality and reality speaks back to us through what can then be called imagination proper. And so whilst they can be mistaken, our fantasies, what goes on inside the mind, they can also connect and amplify and become ways that we receive reality as much as ways that we try to reach out towards reality. And so our imagination feels the call coming to us from reality as much as calls out and tries to touch reality as well. Um, fantasies can be mistaken, but they do precipitate the imaginative engagement with reality that communicates truth to us as well. Now, Blake was onto this in his own way and realized that something else needs to be added to this activity then, which particularly in his later work, he called forgiveness. And I think you can put it like this, that if we're these constantly fantasizing creatures yearning for more for all not just for more for all um we're going to make mistakes we're going to get it wrong um you know we're engaging the erotic the desiring here and sometimes that can misfire maybe very often that can misfire and so blake knew that we need a constant activity of forgiveness as well as a constant activity of reaching out and desiring you know, we do project into the world would be the more psychoanalytic way of putting it. Um, and not only can that make mistakes about ourselves and others, but it can become a kind of addictive habit um, that produces its own energy in a way, but it can easily become a kind of false energy of, you know, hate or accusation. Um, it can spiral down into weaponized accusations of immorality and an opponent or damaging small enclosed worlds where we gather with those who think the same way as us, um, but fail to see that there's more than just what our seeming friends are telling us we can enjoy. So it can, can, it can become dangerous, this business of projecting, and um, it can become tribal, um, this way of living within fantasies. Um, you know, to, to use the phrase from the gospel, we're very inclined to see the speck in our neighbor's eye and ignore the plank in our own. And so Blake realized, um, as he puts it, that forgiveness is the only gospel he believes. It's the good news that we require in order to cultivate divine perception along with the imagination, um, to discern 
what we're seeing and identify with reality, not just with our fantasies. Um, the measure here, I think, is liberty. Um, when we are on the right track, we feel our soul, our heart expanding into the life that's around us. So that in a way, our own limited lives becomes less and less important to us because it becomes increasingly the receiver of the wider life, which, of course, is where it came from to start with, which always was its wellspring. And Blake calls this self-annihilation, um, which is a dramatic way of putting it. I don't think he meant it in a masochistic way, but what he does mean is that when we're engaged in this imagination, combined with forgiveness, we know we're getting it right because there's an expansiveness that comes as well. And we become, in a way, less and less concerned with ourselves and more and more concerned with the life that we can enjoy around us. Now, there's a rather lovely detail, which I'm going to show you now in another slide that captures this moment. Um, there, I hope you can see that now. Um, this is from the title page of Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, which I was quoting from earlier. And I just wanted you to look um, right at the top there, which shows the crescent moon, and I think it's the morning star Venus. Um, and there's the Greek there, uh, monos hoiesus. And um, Blake was a speaker, reader of Greek, um, a self-educated chap. And he throws in these little teasing clues for us as to what he's on about quite often in his plates. And if you knew your New Testament like Blake knew his, you would realize that this phrase, monos hoiesus, appears in two contexts in the Gospels. In the Synoptic Gospels, in Matthew, Mark and Luke, it appears when Jesus is transfigured before Peter, James and John. And the Gospel says that when Peter, James and John were alone with Jesus, he was transfigured before them, the Monosoiesus there. So transformation is being signalled by this phrase appearing on the title page. And it's coupled with the other way that it's used, which is in John's Gospel. And here the phrase Monosoiesus appears when Jesus is left with the woman caught in adultery. Um, those who accused her in John's Gospel have left because Jesus said the one without sin can cast the first stone and they realized that that was their judgment and so it says that she was left alone with Jesus, monos hoiesus, and of course she's there alone with Jesus in this situation to receive forgiveness. So this monos hoiesus captures both the importance of forgiveness that brings liberty so we can see more and see the transfigured life, much as Peter, James and John, when they were alone with Jesus, saw Jesus transfigured before him. It's a vision of the unity of these contraries, this dialectic coming together and overcoming um, the vision that would otherwise bind us. I mean, maybe an analogue with psychotherapy, since we were just mentioning that is quite useful, because sometimes I think in psychotherapy, what you say to someone when they walk into the room is, look, I know you don't feel this, but everything you've done and thought and are wrestling with, even everything that's happened to you, um, is forgiven in this room. And what we're going to do now is try and think about it, try and understand what's gone on, try and make some sense of it so that it can be incorporated and lived with. Um, and I think that, for me, is the heart of forgiveness. Um, it may be something that we have to keep saying to ourselves repeatedly. Um, but I think in, in divine life, and I think this is, I'm completely with Blake on this, the only gospel that I know is the gospel of forgiveness, as he puts it, um, is, it, it, I mean, the, 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 the parable which um, perhaps speaks to this most directly is the parable of the prodigal son, um, you know, where the son goes off, takes his half his um, 
uh, inheritance, spends it all, ends up eating the husks that were fed to the pigs and realizes that if he returned to his father, he would have a better life. Um, and what is so striking is that as he approaches and the father sees him and throws the party, forgiveness isn't even mentioned. Um, he's just welcomed. And I think that's partly what causes the older son um, his strife. Um, shouldn't there even be a need for forgiveness somehow? Um, some kind of recognition of that. And the strange thing is that this eternal vision of forgiveness um, almost, um, I, not, it, it almost um, forgets about the forgiveness that is nonetheless absolutely crucial for eternity to be, to be embraced, put it like that. Um, but look, if you've really got something that needs forgiving, then that's hard and that can be a lifetime's work too. Must remember that. If you know any Blake, you might well know of a famous summary of his about this awakening perception, where he writes to his friend, um, Thomas Butts in a letter. He says, now a fourfold vision see, and a fourfold vision is given to me. Tis fourfold in my supreme delight, and threefold in soft Bueller's light, and twofold always, may God us keep from single vision and Newton's sleep. So what he's intimating there is almost like a kind of spectrum of single, twofold, threefold, and fourfold vision that we can enjoy. And I guess, again, much like feeling the expansiveness, the liberty of forgiveness combined with transformation, bringing on the imagination into infinity. So he's, I think, saying we can kind of track where we're at by thinking, am I seeing with single vision or twofold vision or threefold vision or fourfold vision? So look, here's perhaps Blake's most famous image, the Ancient of Days, um, sometimes celebrated even by religious people as if it's a divine vision, um, but it's not in Blake, actually. Um, it's divine vision trapped and closed you can see this figure that evokes a kind of patriarchal divine figure with dead eyes actually if you look and holding this compass which tries to possess to pin down to narrow to measure this is all vision this is probably the god urizen who doesn't even know that behind the clouds is the sun of divine light so this is science isolated from the arts rather than in resonance with the arts. And this is reason lost in a world devoid of imagination. It's all row, single vision, Newton's sleep, as he famously puts it. But it can stir, it can awaken and produce twofold vision. And this is a vision where there's a sense of life's dynamism. He called it generation. Um, in a way, it's kind of natural life, as we would put it now, biological life. That wants more, um, but sees it mostly in terms of, say, growth or reproduction. Um, here's Loss in the middle of this image here. Um, Loss is the hero of Blake's works, who tries to manufacture that which is divine, tries to keep building Golganusa more and more with his hammer and with his compass there in his furnaces. Um, there's the buildings there behind Loss. Um, but has to contend with the veil um, of Vala there to his right, who would take away the divine vision, even with all the efforts. And you can see there a figure carrying off the sun to the left as well. So generation's got something right, um, but builds that which, whilst constantly rising, constantly falls as well. It needs kind of a constant renewal. Um, and so isn't the fullest vision that Blake can see. But, you know, it's, it's perhaps a familiar mindset um, to us all um, when we're trying to, as it were, you know, like keep life going by mending, by building, by um, accumulating. Um, we sort of need to do it, but it doesn't deliver the full satisfaction. It's the more, more call, not the all. But it too isn't all bad. Remember, there's always light in the darkness for Blake. And here is threefold vision, which he called Beulah. The word comes from an Old Testament word, my land shall be called Beulah, 
Yahweh says in the Hebrew Bible. And Beulah is a lovely place. It's a place where not just generation is known for its own sake, but love and soulfulness and moony nights, as Blake often puts it, is known. The moon, you know, representing a lovely reflection of the divine light. Um, here is one of Blake's images actually from Dante's Divine Comedy. This is right at the top of Mount Purgatory on their last night before they enter the paradise where Virgil and Dante are with Statius sleeping the last night. It's one of the most beautiful moments, I think, actually in the Divine Comedy where suffering is over for Dante and there's the light to get ready for. And Beulah is very much like that. It's the moment where we're held, where we love, where we rest, where we trust life, we know of the things of the soul. But Blake also says, don't rest there, much as Dante has still got the whole of the paradise to go. Beulah is not everything. And if you do rest there, it will actually disintegrate back into generation, back into all row. Because what we can hope for, he says, is fourfold vision, is eternity. Now, this is image of his, I think, sometimes called the Angel of Revelation. And what you can see there in the bottom is the little figure writing, and uh, maybe even Blake himself, receiving this extraordinary burst of light from this ginormous figure um, that he's looking on. And um, the horses and the figures there are riding through the heavens and um, looking up towards the light. Um, this is the vision of it all. This is the vision of eternity, um, which Blake promises. Here's another phrase where Blake explains what the vision can bring. I've sort of, this is from quite a complicated page in the poem, so I've highlighted the bits I'm going to read now. This is a vision of unity when the awakening has happened, when the forgiveness and the transfiguration are working together. And Blake writes, at the clangor of the arrows of intellect, the innumerable chariots of the Almighty appeared in heaven, and Bacon and Newton and Locke, the philosophic and empirical characters, and Milton and Shakespeare and Chaucer, the poetic and prophetic, they've come together now. A sun of blood red wrath surrounding heaven on all sides around, glorious, incomprehensible by mortal man, and such chariot was sexual threefold, and every man stood fourfold. Each four faces had, one to the west, one to the east, one to the south, one to the north. The horses fourfold and the dim chaos brightened beneath, above, around, eyes as the peacock. Um, the peacock's tail there, I guess, being invoked with eyes that can look in all direction. And it continues a bit more over the page where Blake writes, all human forms identified even tree, metal, earth, and stone. So this is the human sight, being able to see the life identified even in tree, metal, earth, and stone, all human forms identified, living, going forth, and returning wearied into the planetary lives of years, months, days, and hours, reposing, and then awakening into his bosom in the life of immortality. So there's the sense here of mortal life, um, wearied into the planetary lives of years, months, days and hours, nonetheless still containing the possibility of awakening into the bosom of the life of immortality. Blake says that um, the life of eternity is characterised by a dyna dynamism which can be what he calls the wars of love as opposed to wars of separation. Here's a famous image from Jerusalem, Emanation of the Giant Albion, which is loss talking to his spectre, and the spectre is truly the dark side of ourselves. Um, but Loss here is telling his spectra, look, either get on board or disappear, and eventually actually the spectre just dissolves as the divine light appears. Um, it's Blake's version of the way up and the way down being deeply interlinked. Um, Nothing can separate us from the love of God, you might say, which means that we can look with confidence even into the night. Um, eternal death is held by eternal life, Blake describes at the end of the poem as well. And that 
is very much part of the life of eternity. It's not a cutting off. That would be a negation of part of life. It's always a bringing together for Blake when the light of eternity is known and is experienced. Just to sort of come by this again and think particularly about the figure of Jesus a little more. Um, you know, Jesus is a figure for particularly Blake's later work. I um, mean, his earlier work um, and in the middle part of his life, actually, Jesus almost disappears, but comes back in his later work. And Jesus, for him, is the living presence of the imagination. Um, you know, in traditional Christian theology, Jesus is the incarnation of the logos, the logos meaning the word that makes the principle or tendency allure that is both creative and returning to the divine always. And so Jesus, when we know Jesus, Blake might say, is when we know the imagination, when we feel that either within ourselves or in dialogue with others or in our making, in our looking, we feel not just the life of what we're engaged with, but we feel the life behind that life which sustains it, being itself, um, I think I must have mentioned in earlier talks. And so Jesus is this presence. And so here at the top here, which shows the unity of Albion and his emanation, um, Jerusalem coming back together again, and so rising towards the heavens. Um, Blake writes, then Jesus appeared. This is what it is for Jesus to appear, standing by Albion as the good shepherd, by the lost sheep that he have found, and Albion knew that it was the Lord, the universal human. This is how Blake understands the crucifix and the role of the crucifixion in Christianity. Um, you know, here again in this illustration, at first maybe it seems like a, a familiar figure of Christ dying on the cross, um, but then you ask yourself, wait a minute, it's not a cross, it's actually a tree, and it's a tree that's bearing fruit. And then Jesus has died, his eyes are closed, and yet in that very moment of death, there seems to be like a sunburst, a blaze of light that emerges in this moment as well. And here we have the figure standing before Christ, emanating the cruciform shape. I guess this might be Blake, this might be Albion, this could be us. And so it's saying that in this eternal vision, the cruciform can be embraced because all things come together and bear the fruits of life. Jesus is the imagination and has shown us the way of the imagination as well. Forgiveness, transformation coming together in the ultimate dualities or contraries of life and death. There's another brilliant way that Blake summarizes this in a wonderful verse. Um, sometimes called eternity, because in his notebook he wrote eternity above it. I think this is referring to the eternal vision, a fourfold vision. Um, but in this quatrain, he summarizes the dynamic when he says, he who binds to himself a joy does the winged life destroy, but he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. This is the overcoming of the impulse to hold joy, to bind it to us as if that somehow can help us to grip life and stay with life. No, Blake is saying that destroys winged life, which doesn't stop for us. But when we can learn to kiss the joy as it flies, and so fly with it, then we can live in eternity's sunrise. I think sunrise here being the constant emergence of new and more life and light. Following on from the vision of the cross, um, Blake knew what actually the early patristic fathers in the Christian faith knew um, was the reason for the incarnation. Um, it wasn't a sacrifice that would take away sin, as if sin could have the power to separate us from the divine. Um, rather, it was to make clear to us the way back to the divine. Therefore, God becomes as we are, that we may be as he is. Blake summarises it here. Now, we know 
much about this, I think, from our love lives, from our erotic lives, just to come to my sort of final section and ask how we can know this quite palpably and distinctly, not just through Blake's wonderful verse, but for our own direct experience. And this is reflecting on the notion of dividing in Blake's um, understanding. Um, dividing um, in one way is a bad damaging action um, that happens, you know, so Albion is divided from his emanation Jerusalem, the male is divided from the female, um, the divine is divided from um, the rational, from the empirical, um, reason separates out from the imagination. Um, but as ever with Blake, and as we've seen with Dante and Plato too, um, that which separates also gives us a clue as to how to find the way back, because by bringing them back together again, by unifying, by integrating, we can climb the spiral back towards the transcendent. And so this is a deep understanding, I think, of what Blake made of the sexual in our lives. Um, you don't have to read much about Blake to realize that the erotic was very important. And sometimes people, um, even suggest that Blake was into a kind of libertarian view of life um, and advocated free love. And there's no doubt that in some of those he associated with amongst his circle, figures like actually uh, Mary Wollstonecraft and others, um, it seems that they did advocate free love, not just confining erotic life to marriage. But I think Blake knew that that libertarianism was a kind of, I don't know, generation, maybe Beulah mess up, um, was going to keep you trapped in the lower possibilities of vision. And this is an image from Milton, um, which demonstrates, I think, his fuller understanding of love. Um, it shows two figures um, reposing, presumably post-coitally upon the rocks of earth. Um, some people say it's actually William and Catherine Blake. It's uh, almost a kind of inner self-portrait. Um, but after the act of making love, the figure looks up and sees the eagle of eternity coming down, sees the creature that had the sight, it was said, that could look straight into the sun and so therefore straight at God. And I think what Blake's telling us in this image is that the erotic is a memory of how things can be brought together and the tremendous thrill of falling in love and even the fantasy of libertarian free love can speak to us of unified life once again. But it still plays with this dividing, it's still trapped in the separation of male and female. Um, it, it really drives on the energy of extra pleasure seeking rather than the divine energy that is satisfied because it participates in the infinite, in its all. And even in the yearning of erotic life, you might say, you know, the, the unrequited love, um, the desire that longs, Blake is suggesting it's possible to turn that around and to feel the divine reaching for us across the pain, across the suffering. Um, in a funny sort of way, the more the agony of longing, the greater we're experiencing the reach of divine light. Um, the eagle is swooping down towards us even as we feel the yearning. And Blake thought that the male and the female can come together in two ways. And one, he wasn't so keen on, he called it the, the hermaphroditic union. And I think what he meant by that, and again, you know, apologies um, if, um, you know, that is offensive, um, but what he meant by that is um, it's a union that, well, it's a coming together that's not really a union, that doesn't transfigure, that doesn't make or recover something that always was the case. It's a kind of unhappy coupling, you might say. Um, whereas um, the transfiguring 
um, for him was actually the form of what he calls humanity. Um, and he, you know, he's biblical about this. He, he knows the Hebrew well enough to know that um, before Adam and Eve, there was just humanity and that part of the creation was the dividing of male and female. It wasn't like before there was just male and then the female was tacked on. No, before there was humanity that communed with the divine um, in the cool of the day. And um, so he thought that our end too is a kind of, you might say, androgyny, um, the recovery of a humanity um, that we will know, not just within ourselves as individuals, I think, but because we'll all be part of the divine dance, the divine dynamism. And um, if you know, remember a bit of Dante from last week, as he rises through the heavens, the individuals become more and more themselves. And as they do that, they become more and more part of the divine unity as well. And um, that's that's the dynamic. Um, I, I don't know, I, I, I find actually strangely, when I was looking around for this idea of what this androgyny might be like, um, so it's not a sort of loss of sexuality, but is somehow the crown of sexuality. Um, I actually find Virginia Woolf's um, essay, Rune von Zohn, quite helpful because of all the things that she says in there, um, you know, not least the need for a room of one's own, which is a kind of individuality, that isn't the final goal for her. The goal for her in her writing is what she calls the androgynous mind, which is when your own, she puts it something like this, your own desire to rehearse your offences, to um, express your complaints about life, um, to worry, about the injustices which need to be done in one moment don't get me wrong need to be done in one moment but if that's the whole of life then she says you can't become transparent to life itself which she finds in the androgynous mind say of figures like Shakespeare and you know I think you could add in figures like Blake as well and that you know that because this is when just taking the case of the artist or the writer they start to disappear in their work. We know less and less about them as individuals and more and more about what they're trying to communicate. I mean, it's there in Plato too. Um, you, 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 you could write down everything we know about Plato on the sides, you know, on one side of paper, piece of paper. And Plato himself doesn't ever feature in his dialogue except on three occasions, which is sort of right at the beginning of the dialogue. And it says something like, and Plato was present and then he left. And you think, why did he say that? I think that these great writers have this quality of what Virginia Woolf called the androgynous mind, where they're so present that they almost disappear and the whole of life can flow through them. That's something of the dynamic um, of eternity that I think Blake was onto as well, um, when he talks about transfiguring as much as transforming. And I think that, you know, that says something important about how, you know, we might know this in the intimacies of our own lives, when you think across the course of your love life, which was no doubt really important for Blake. Um, these contraries are not just intimately and powerfully felt in our own psychology, um, but given an indication as how they can expand um, and so help us return to the divine vision. I think it's what William discovered with Catherine. Um, there is a story that William asked Catherine one day whether he might really embrace the gospel of free love and find another lover. And it said that Catherine cried and William replied, no, I understand now that even in this moment of suffering, that's the divine vision reaching out towards us. Um, and so knew something of fourfold vision, not being stuck in generation and in Beulah, lovely as they might be. You know, it's about feeling into your experiences of love, say, your experiences of friendship, and realizing that the joy and the disappointment, you know, aren't the end of the story. Um, that they, as um, you know, we were saying just now, um, are actually intimations of um, divine life. And so always following through this golden thread, um, this golden string, I think is really important as well. Um, 
Beulah, threefold vision is the land of rest. And we need that at times, uh, maybe particularly on a Sunday evening. Um, but we're actually called to what Blake called wars of love and engaging in the furnaces of affliction, but knowing that that always leads to the more. So, you know, cleansing the doors of perception isn't just about um, the kind of dramatic peak experience. Um, by engaging and saying yes to life, that process of opening, um, perception expands as well. Um, by imagination in part, but not just kind of isolated imagination like, you know, you might imagine the imagination of the artist, because the artist will tell you right away that the way to feed the imagination is to go for walks, is to experiment with materials, is to try new combinations of colour, um, is to turn to the dark parts of yourself as much as the lights and so on. And it's a very active, that we stressed, you know, the active side of it um, as well. Um, this is the plate from the end of Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, which shows something um, of, I think, Jerusalem, there she is with her hair, embracing the divine vision fully. I hope you've got a feel for the meaning of the dualities in Blake, for the palpable sense of the contraries that we can know, not just because we read about them, but because we feel for them. I hope you've got a sense of how they work, that in a way when combined with imagination and forgiveness for all the mistakes we make, we can find a path to that expansive transformation, which is the cleansing of the doors of perception. Um, I hope you've got a sense that how there's always hope in Blake, that the dividing, the separation, the falling is at once the intimation of the combining, the uniting, the ascending once more. We're never lost in this world, no matter how dark it gets and how we can experience that in our lives, not just sort of in spiritual terms, but in these very embodied erotic terms as well. You know, dualities can speak of our divided lives for sure and our lack of perception, but also of the co-creativity that we can embrace and so find the divine vision once more. Um, you might say that God doesn't need the opposites, but in a funny sort of way we do, even as life is an overcoming of the opposites. They remind us of the possibility of return and the route towards return. Our fantasies, to give it the psychodynamic twist, aren't just random, mistaken though they can be. With discernment, we can find that they're resonances with reality. When we look through the corporeal eye, much like we look through the window and so see the light approaching us, even as we are nudging towards it.